Yay. Yeah. Thanks everybody for showing up tonight. I'm super honored that they, um, that they asked and we got to speak to the students. And so now we get to do the parents, which I think it's important that everybody gets on the same page. So let me just get this queued up here. All right, are you guys seeing my slides deck? Are you seeing my slides, slides, Andy? Um, it's still loading. It's perfect. Um, still kind of a white screen. Maybe stop presenting and then just redo it again. I think it might have got locked up or something. No problem. Yeah. We got to lift it. Loving technology, everybody. We got to have some fun here. So, all right. We'll just do. We're just going to do it this way. All right. There we go. Yay, I love technology. Thanks, Sandy. Yep. All right, here we go. Um, my background is in education. I still have my credential. I taught middle school for 13 years, started seeing a major increase in social media, everything from fake pages, hate pages, inappropriate text messages, um, people leaving people out. Students kept coming to me with all these different issues. So I just started stopping and educating them, empowering them on what to do with it. So I'm super honored you're here that uh, you took the time. Um, they are recording this. So if you know some parents that need to see this too, that then you can have that playback because how many of you guys remember teaching your kid how to read? You had to sit side by side with them and help them decode the words, analyze the story, right? And even though it took a lot of time and energy, um, it was worth it, right? Like they actually learned how to read and you probably wanted to even shout the words out at them because they were doing it wrong, but you kind of have to let them naturally, you know, learn themselves every once in a while. So same thing needs to happen with these devices is sitting side by side with them, help them decode the message, analyze the context, right? Is this negative? Is this positive? Is this appropriate? Is this inappropriate? And that's what parents need to do, like realize, just like when they get their permit, you have to sit side by side with them in the passenger seat of the car, even though I'm sure you're like nervous and you're like, oh my gosh, and probably like everyone's mom put your foot down and like it's the break, <laughs> but um, they're in control, right? Like they have to have control. You're just there to guide them. And then at some point they turn 16, they have to have the driver's license that they got to be able to drive these this, that machine by themselves. So tonight, my goal is that you can walk away with um, confidence that um, you come back away with confidence that you know what to do and that you have some steps. I, I tell you, Hey, here's some things. And then it's, what will you do when you leave? Right? So that's why it's called, I can help. Is everybody in here can help? The question is, will you, and what will you actually do? Here's some is, is children are deprived of healthy fundamentals. Um, emotionally available, uh, parents clearly define limits and guidance. I mean, think about it. What is the age that, uh, students should get a smartphone, <laughs> right? And the answer is the suggested age is 13, but how many of you guys actually know someone who is under 13 who already has a smartphone? So there's no defined limits and guidance of when they're supposed to have that phone. Just like when you get your permit, you're, you, have to be, you have to be 15. To get your driver's license, you have to be 16. Like that's defined limits and guidance. How much screen time are you supposed to have? Like there's no defined limits and guidance because it is based off of the individuals responsibilities, like they're getting less and less responsibilities at this age, balance, nutrition, adequate sleep, movement outdoors, creative play, inter social interaction, and downtime. These are all is's of what they're being deprived of healthy fundamentals. I tell you this so that we can then figure out a solution, right? As we're here again, media is affecting our health. These are all normal things like that. We need to see these so we can figure out what we can do to help. Right. So these are all real stats. Um, I think it's interesting to see that 40, 48% of teens don't turn to adults for help. If you ask middle school students, why is this? Hey, why don't you turn this into adults? The number one reason middle schoolers will say is that uh, they're afraid that their device is going to get taken away. Right. When they do. Uh, the number one reason you ask high school students why this is 
they will say snitches get stitches. That mentality is there, right? So my question always back to them is at what point is you no longer being a snitch and when is it okay for you to ask for help? And even teach them what they could do if they don't want to be a snitch of like that person, could you give them enough information that the adults can kind of work through it um, from that, right? And just even seeing that, yeah, suicide, or by the way, 50% of teens and even adults are addicted to devices. So it is now an actual addiction. And number two cause of death nationwide for 10 to 24 year olds is suicide. Um, 10, when I was 10, I didn't even know what that was, right? So it is that kind of thing that we need to understand these are is's that we all can help. That 45.5 hours each week in front of digital screens for eight to 28 year olds. This is common thing like that realizing that your child is spending more time with a screen than they are with you. So helping you with the tools tonight on what you actually can do to support your kid with these devices because things do happen. But what I think interesting is, is a lot of times when things do happen on these devices, they want to go to the schools, right? They want to go to schools saying like, hey, it's now the principal's fault. But at the same time, this didn't happen at school. Um, no one's wearing school attire. This happened at someone's house. And parents need to get more involved, right? That we need to get parents and students and the and the schools and even the tech companies all on the same page of like how they can help. Because it is, it's like figuring out what is your actual lane that you should be in, but then also understanding when things go do go down at a school, knowing what your lane is, because at a school, information does go slower because there's a process, right, of how things go. And unfortunately, social media is like this, right? It's like a huge web. So you might hear about something that's happened at school before the school can get to let you know because they have to go through a process of everything. And so just knowing what your lane is and making sure you kind of trust the system sometimes, knowing that social media is way faster um, with information. And letting students, knowing students can be part of the solution. We get students every year to 10 of them will let us know about school threats reported right away. They'll let us know about suicide threats to a trusted adult. Over 1,500 re um, report um, negative sites do get reported to us that we help take down or the students know how to take it down because we taught them how to do this. And then they're creating the positive online content because we allow them to be a part of the solution. So just knowing that they have the power and when you give them that power, they know what to do. We are a nonprofit, we're a 5013C, and with our nonprofit, our mission, we empower student change makers. We promote digital safety. And then we also celebrate, which I think this is the biggest one that even adults and parents forget to do. If your kid is using digital for good, make sure you celebrate that. Don't always just nag on them because they um, have it, they're on it all the time, right? If your kid actually puts it away for dinner, are you praising them? Like, hey, thank you for so much for putting your phone away before you came to dinner. Like, are you praising them when, you know, they let you know um, you, something like wh what somebody posted? Like, oh my gosh, did you see what they did? Like praise them when they do what you want them to do as well online. So uh, they will be sending out these parent guidelines, but we're going to go through um, our parent guidelines, which has 10, 10 things to it. Uh, and you just kind of can go back and follow along and see more tips. But the first one of the parental parent guidelines, just follow and friend your child right on any social media sites. If your kid, or if you're the type of parent who wants to know your, who your kid hangs out with in real life, you should also be a parent who wants to know who your kid hangs out with online, right? So, and where your kid is hanging out, right? So these are all the 10 social media sites that students hang on. If you don't know what they are, I'm going to kind of walk through them. We also have on our website and I can uh, send it to you too, is it just kind of explains how they use them. So if you don't know how they're being used, we actually have a free resource that also explains it. Uh, the top um, left is first Instagram, then it's discord, YouTube, even camera. What kind of pictures is your kid taking? Second row, it's what's up app, which is used for group chats, especially for Samsung's and Apple, they have a hard time talking to each other. And then it's also for international. Uh, a lot of students use that if they have any international friends or family. Next one over is TikTok, uh, text. So who are they texting? Who are they in group chats with? Twitter, email. Like who, if they have email, if they have any kind of Google documents, they can share different things back and forth on the Google Docs. Roblox and under... Um, that is also Minecraft, right? I'm sorry, not Minecraft, is Fortnite, sorry, is Fortnite. And then Snap, inside Snap, there's even another feature called Yellow that's inside of Snap. And then next to the last one is Twitch. 
And a new one that's out um, is called Be Real. So those are all the main ones that students are using and you should know what they are. Most of these are 13 plus. The ones that are not um, are of course texting, but um, Roblox is eight plus, Fortnite is 12 plus. So if your kid is not those ages, they shouldn't even have these. So again, trying to get it down to where they can have those guidance. Like you can't have TikTok until you are 13 really is going to help them mentally because we need to start having those kind of conversations and getting people on the same page, right? And again, if your kid is on these, you should be on them too, either on their accounts or having it on your phone and making sure you play with it. So you can hear what they're doing and who they're hanging out with, where they're hanging out with is a big one. Number two in the parental guidelines is going over on a regular basis what information they should not be sharing right online or over text. Because I think this is a big thing we forget is even like their full name. Um, my username on my Instagram is Kim Carr, um, underscore I can help. The reason why is because I'm a public speaker. I need people to be able to find me. But if you want that to be protected, is your kid's username their full name? Because if it is, it's easy for me to Google search them. It's easy for me to find them um, on other things, right? So just make sure you kind of understand that phone numbers, addresses, credit card numbers, even their school name. They can put their school like abbreviations because if I'm not from that area, it would be harder for me to find out if it just had abbreviations. And they didn't have passwords. Even to get into your phone, uh, I think that's important so that they know that's that's private information. Just like you don't ask people what their age is or what their weight is, right? That's private information just like passwords. Realizing social media is your resume for life, right? Like talking to them about like colleges and employees are checking their social media, right? Um, even as you as an adult, what you can also share is, I don't know if you know this, but I actually just rented an Airbnb. They asked me for my social media accounts, right? Because Airbnb people, if they get uh, um, have parties, somebody has a party um, and they get written up, then they no longer can rent that house as an Airbnb things because these neighbors are getting tired of Airbnbs having parties. So that's a new thing that um, Airbnb has been put into play. So again, social media is a resume for life. Those are the kind of terminologies you wanna write down while you take this um, session. So you can use these in your everyday conversation with your kid, because it just sounds better than just being like, don't have this, right? Like just say hey, social media is a resume for life for you watching what you're saying. A fun way you can do this is have you ever Google search yourself, right? So if you ever Google search my name, I did not know that I am a risky bo um, book author. <laughs> um, somebody actually used my name as their, their book handle. And so it's just kind of fun. So you can teach them about what a digital footprint is, right? Or I like to call it a digital tattoo because it's more permanency. They understand that. A footprint is kind of like a, right? But a tattoo is more permanent. So even let them Google search you because you're older. So, you, so Google's a worldwide web where they're still localized that they might not, if you Google search them, might nothing might not come up yet, yet, as I say, right? So it's kind of fun. Let them Google search your family, then have a conversation about digital tattoos. Know your child's passwords and all their devices and social media. I think this is important. Uh, a lot of people don't want to invade in their kids' privacy, which is totally understandable. You wouldn't you know, open up your kid's journal and read it and you, um, you have to, but you have the right to go in your kid's room, right? To like, if you have any kind of suspicions or whatever else, like you have that right to go in there. You're paying for your kid's phone. Some parents like, well, actually they pay for it. They're still underneath your house, right? Like you're still in charge of them. If something does go down, you are actually at risk to actually get in trouble if they're doing something underneath your house on a device that's in your plan, right? So just understanding um, this is important that you have their passwords because something could happen. And this is, you know, this is a new source that anybody can get hold of. So here's some cute, you know, high school girls that uh, were doing this, you know, cute picture that they wanted to post it, you know, bass class, right? Um, and then all of a sudden a couple of them decided to do this where they sent it to one person as they thought made a different word um, with this. And then they sent it to one student who took a screenshot, sent it to their friend. And then of course, everyone was upset and now they're wanting to get these students expelled. So it's this kind of conversation, it would it help if they would have got taken it down, if they would have been able to you know, have this, making sure you kind of have that. Another case I actually had to help with um, was the student literally had this in his backpack he took it out long enough just for this photo, but you can see that they're in the hallway. It was actually students of color who dared him to take this photo. 
Um, and it was up on a story long enough that someone took a screenshot and was able to get passed around. It was easy for the media to get a hold of um, because they he didn't take it down, right? So it's making sure the parents have those passwords and have that. I've actually had to help um, my dad take some stuff down. I have my parents' passwords because they don't know how to take things down. Set limits, right? Monitor your kids' um, mobile use and text messages on a regular basis. I think this is important. Like everything's so un unlimited now, right? Like most of these plans are unlimited, but nothing should be unlimited. Like, would you give your kid a credit card and say, oh yeah, this is unlimited. Like go spend as much as you want. Um, would you let them go to the buffet and be like, go eat as much as you want? Like, I'm hoping you'd have some kind of a limit on them um, and monitor it. Like, how much are they using? Are they, you know, if it, each month you can should be able to see how many text message, how much um, Wi-Fi they're using, because then you want to see if it's high or if it's low, right? That, that's kind of things you want to kind of um, see. So the big thing also a lot of parents don't know is that you can actually control, set up parental controls on your home Wi-Fi. Just like the school can set up the Wi-Fi and change that settings, you can do that with your own. So the big one that I would suggest, number one thing you should do is you can actually permit websites. So right there, you can easily just include, you know, Pornhub. Um, that would be easy for you to limit that. They can't see that. You can permit that from your from your search at your house. You can do restricted time settings. So making that their Wi-Fi turns off at you know 10 p.m. and it doesn't open up until 7 a.m. so they get their sleep. So just showing you these are all things that you can do simply off your, your Wi-Fi parental controls. The question is, will you set them up, right? And even will you look at their monitor, their screen time? If you have a if you don't have an iPhone, it's just called the uh, digital wellness. You can also search that. So you can see how much time they're using. You can even set up downtime and put in a code um, for them so that they can't use it over this amount. Um, so uh, this is mine. My daily average is six, six hours, 57 minutes. I even do conversations like who's got the highest, who's got the lowest. I don't shame them. It's more of a conversation starter, right? The more you shame them, if you shame them for it, they're not likely going to tell you how they're using it. But then if you click it again, you can actually see where they're spending their time. And it's just a great way for them to reflect, self-reflect. Hey, I need to call myself out. Like um, this one, you can see I spend it a lot on directions because I drive a lot. But I had two hours and 41 minutes on Facebook, probably because I do a lot of work on there in an hour and 23, right? Um, but I can be like, oh, challenge myself next week. I can limit myself a little bit less on that, right? How you can also monitor your kids um, is if you actually directly go into TikTok, you can add, you can set up privacy and safety. So you can make it where they make sure they have it on private instead of on public. You can make it where um, who comments is you can either choose everyone, friends only, or you can turn it off where no one can comment. No one can do what with them. Um, who can re even react like, like it, say no one, right? And who can send them messages? No one. You can set that up how you want so you can monitor that end. You can also do the digital wellness through TikTok. So you can go to your, you'd have to go to your kid's actual device, go to their TikTok. You'd have to set up screen time management. You put on restricted mode and then you would actually put a passcode in so they can't change it and then enable it. And then they can't change it automatically. If you only give them 30 minutes a day, it would automatically shut off after 30 minutes. I think it's really cool because TikTok didn't really have any parental controls, neither did Snap or Instagram. They all have them now and they're all brand new within the past, like I'd say three, I think it's been like three months, I want to say. So Snap is a little bit different than um, TikTok, but Instagram is very similar to Snap. What they do is you would have to have Snap and Instagram on your phone. You would then go to what's called Family Center. You would invite, if your kid is named Zoe, you would invite Zoe to your Family Center. Zoe would have to accept. And then once Zoe accepts, this is what it looks like. Yours is on the left and Zoe's is on the right. You see exactly who Zoe is sending messages to. So you can see Lori T, Adam um, Banks, Megan uh, Levy, right? You see who she's sending messages to. You also see what time because a lot of students are getting messages at two in the morning. So that way you can be like, hey, you need to tell your friends no more messages after, you know, whatever it might be, 9 p.m. You can say like, no, you tell them you do not send any messages like, that's just not, that's not a thing in our house. Um, if you can see, you can actually, there's a flag there. So you see there's a Carlos Boozer. You're like, who's Carlos Boozer? I don't know this kid. You can actually report it from your side. That flag is the report flag. You can report it from the parent perspective, which has higher power 
um, on that end. But the question is, will you set this up, right? We go into the family center and set it up. Number five is watch your child for parental, uh, potential signs of abuse and um, addiction. Because again, 50% of them are addicted. So how you can do that is because you, usually if their Wi-Fi or their texting is really high or if they're moody, things like that, something is definitely going on. Um, so you, there's a lot of signs um, of overuse, even gamers. A lot of gamers get really crabby. They get um, uh, agile really quickly. So it's so important that you kind of are monitoring that. Um, here's an example of a parent that didn't know that something was affecting her from social media. So she's like, and I, by the way, I shared the story with the students at the school. Her name is Bailey. And she wants to see how her, how her day went on a regular basis, right? She gets dressed thinking she's looking great. Then later on, someone takes the picture of the back of her legs. They circle it. They caption it thick. If you think this is messed up, then why you need to start helping? And the problem is, again, students are not helping. 48% of them did not turn to adults. No one went to Dylan letting him know this is not okay. This is not how I want to be treated. This happened to her on a regular daily basis that people took pictures like this of this girl. Not one person went to Bailey saying, are you okay? I saw what Dylan posted about you. That is messed up. I got your back. Right? So we need to train people how we want to be treated, but how we're allowing others to be treated. But let's get it straight, parents. What you need to realize, I see a lot of adults doing the same thing where they're taking pictures of people they don't know or do know for their own humor. How are we supposed to train these students to do not do this when we ourselves do it? So we need to make sure we're calling this out and letting our kids know. They aren't taking screenshots and then turn into adults. So making sure they know how to take screenshots that you yourself know how to take screenshots, turn to the adults so we can get the help um, that they need, right? The girl then had to text her mom, hey, mom, can you bring me clothes? Because she's been telling her mom isn't going on a regular basis. Her mom's got the apparent annoyed voice like you, what do you got on if I have time? She then has to tell her, I'm in a dress. People are making fun of me, taking pictures of me, and I want to change. Now her mom changed her tone. Do you need shoes? I'll be there in seven minutes. So just teach you and your students how to be what we call digital first responders. They're the first ones to the scene. We don't see their snaps, right? Like we don't see their TikToks all the time. We don't, it's hard. So we need them to be trained how to be these digital first responders. So when they're the first ones to the scene, they know how to report. They know how to take a screenshot. They know how to comment respectfully. They know how to check on the person who might be being attacked, right? Like they know how to handle this. Just like if they saw a car accident that they would call 911. And again, how can they control these devices instead of the devices controlling their life? Right? And you have to give, you have to be, give examples um, of how you're controlling your device. Um, the big one that I do is I actually uh, put my phone, um, all my group chats are 100% on mute. I even ask a lot of my friends, please don't put me into a group chat because I just can't have my phone like kind of blowing up because of what I do for a living. So I, I have to, that works for me, right? The other thing that I try to do is I, um, I try not to check my phone after a certain time. Like I have a really cutoff that I try not to look at my phone anymore. I have some friends who don't check their phones the first thing when they wake up. Um, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> that does not work for me because I get a lot of people um, that are on different time zone than me. My nieces live in Stockholm, Sweden. And so they send me messages. So yes, when I wake up, I want to see if my nieces have sent me a message so I can respond back to them because uh, it's time zones are so different that I only have such a small window. And sharing what works for you and hearing what works for them, right? We did go over your, your student about the emotional first aid kit because, again, if your kid is going through some hard times or they're feeling lonely and they're feeling left out, you want to teach them some emotional first aid kit so you can have it. And honestly, because they, have, they don't have emotionally available parents, I think parents also need to be taught this on their emotional first aid kit. So we did walk through this when we um, presented to the thing, so I want to make sure you guys see it. But these are the six things. Um, sounds like, hey, what is your, your kid's favorite song? What's your favorite song that can just spark joy, right? Are you making a playlist? Like, why not have a playlist when you're they're going to school? Like, hey, what kind of songs do we want to have to get you ready for school? What are the songs that you want when you um, when I pick you up from school or when you come home from school, right? And if they're in a bad mood when they get home, can you go, hey, Alexa, play whatever, right? Like, these are the kind of things you want to kind of create to kind of change that. Sites, right? First is like, what's something that your kid just gets excited about when they see it? For me, my mom knows it. I love food. So anything the sight of food, it just sparks a massive joy for me. Um, anything like, 
What is your kid's sites that they love to see? Most people, it's their bed, <laughs> right? And then it's like, what's their screensaver? And ask them, hey, what's your screensaver this month? And then even show them yours and like why it is. Change up your screensaver because um, it changes your mood. The third one is touch. Uh, I have a, I only wear soft t-shirts now. I have a certain blanket at home. Um, uh, you know, most people have pets, right? So does your kid have something? A lot of parents have actually bought certain kind of uh, pillows, like a furry pillow, because they like that touch. Number four is smells. What kind of smells do you have in your house? Do you have candles burning? Do you have essential oils? Um, you know, do you bake a little bit like to help your kid, especially like when they have, if they have finals coming up, make those special smells that kind of calms them down. Buying lavender um, lotion helps calm people down. So just some of those simple things that kind of helps. Five is even knowing they're humans, like who's their people they go to when they need help. But I'm going to be real with you. They're at that age now that you might not be their human. They go talk to because it's sometimes embarrassing. My mom's not my human that I go talk to because she has a lot of anxiety, right? She worries so much that I tell her all the time. I'm like, mom, I can't tell you a lot of stuff, because what, especially what I do because she worries so much. But I always tell her, like, I'm talking to somebody and I usually say this is who I talk to about it today, right? So as long as you're asking them who their humans are and making sure you understand that a lot of adults have a hard time asking for help. So you need to make sure you're setting up a good role model for them that you are asking for help when you need it. And the last one is taking action. Like when they're stressed and they're lonely, when they're feeling depressed, or even you yourself, are you taking action, taking power back, owning a higher feeling? And then taking some power back for like, if you go for a run or do a dance party or cook or clean, whatever makes you feel better, like feel, you know, find some joy. Those are what you do. So that's your emotional first aid kit to help with those pieces. Number six is checking the privacy and security and GPS settings on your phone and social media, right? Like, do you even know how to do that? So the big one that a lot of people don't know, even if you just go while I'm saying this, go to your photos right now. And if you actually just go to one of them, pop it open, swipe up. If you swipe up, it'll, if your locations are on, it'll show you exactly where you took that picture, right? If you, it'll say, if your locations are not on, it'll say add location, but all you have to do is click that and it'll show you where you took that picture. But if your locations are off, if you text me that picture, if I just save it to my camera, all the camera roll, even though I don't know you, all I have to do is swipe up. I can see exactly where you took it. Okay. So another one that they're making sure is like their privacy is their accounts on private? If you want their accounts being on private, are you checking that they have them on private? A lot of, and it's easy to go turn it off. So you might've set it up private, but they could have now turned it on to public. So again, making sure you're checking that, that's something that's easy. A lot of parents I know, they take their kid's phone and they were doing, they're like, I'm doing a phone check this right now, this week. They go through the text, see who they're texting. They go through their um, settings to make sure they're on where you had sent them up to. Um, that they take their phones. It's like, it's a normal routine that they do a phone check. Like, and that is okay to do as a parent. You're not in there to go and like, um, you know, all these different things, but this is your kid. You're making sure, and you don't have, it's like an investigation process. It's just like, just check in. Like, this is what we do. We're making sure you're being safe, um, that you're under my roof and having that kind of things, right? Um, again, Snap Map. So if they have Snapchat, knowing that they can have show their locations with this, they can have ghost mode, which means no one can see it. I will be honest with you. I have my Snap Maps on. Um, my nieces have theirs on. But they only allow certain friends. Um, well, I have nieces that are 18. They allow all their friends to see where they're at, but they're very selective of who they allow into their Snap. They don't have hundreds and hundreds of people following them on their Snapchat. They're very selective of who they have. They can also put on ghost mode for a certain amount of time. So like, especially if you're traveling, you don't want people to know that you're away from your house or, but I will be honest with you, some of them will turn their ghost mode on, on, um, for a certain amount of time. If they're going over to someone's friend's house, they don't want to see their, let their friends or their parents see where they're at. So if it scares you on locations, when in doubt, you leave it out, right? I am, I have my locations on for the most part. I just know this and I'm just very careful when I do share it. Discuss with your child about who they friend, right? Who are they friending on social media? I think that's important. Just like who you talk to, like all that kind of stuff. It's important because let's get real. Like they can meet people online now. Um, but then that, it's also what pages they're following. So this one's called Davis High School Roast. Um, they're roasting students. This was a special needs student that someone wanted to roast. 
Um, the parent reached out to me, asked me, how can I get this down? So how do you take it down? You have to report the page. But what was interesting about this page is it has 178 followers. So your kid can be following an account just like this. Is this what you want them to follow? Right? You can find out who they're following by simply going to their Instagram, simply going to their TikTok, looking to see who they follow, even what are they subscribing to? Who are they playing with on their video games? You can easily go see that by, you know, go looking at their stuff. Right? So simple things. The biggest thing I think concerning is these students are like, oh, well, all these people gave me consent to roast. Well, technically that last kid's not even on Instagram, but they roast them anyhow. So that's like how that is. But this is how students kind of think. Again, if your kid is a gamer, right? If your kid is a gamer, are you knowing what they're saying, how they're talking, either through the chat or through the headset, headsets? Uh, a lot of parents have allowed their kids to have their gaming consoles in their bedroom with shut doors, right? Like this is a powerful tool. Are you knowing what's being said? and you know talk to so a lot of now parents have now changed this where they have the gaming devices in a central location so that they can easily hear what's being said is it appropriate for what they're looking for also can you teach your kid like what's the difference between you know when does it cross the line here's if this is the line when does it cross the line of being fun and funny and when does it cross the line of being inappropriate rude and flat out cruel like you can smack talk when you're playing but what what is appropriate and what is inappropriate you got to have those conversations because this is the kind of stuff they're doing. And then even walking them through like what they can say back, what they can do because they can block people online. They can tell their friend if like, Hey, I don't want to play with you anymore. If this is how you're going to talk. So a lot of students have had to do these kind of things. Um, they just sometimes don't know how to. So walking them through those different scenarios or even simply asking them, Hey, if you're on and you're, there's someone you don't want to play with, like, how do you handle that? So that you can ask them as a discussion and that they feel comfortable. There are things that happen, like here's TikTok, things were going up, it was called Devious Slick, people were stealing stuff, they were damaging things, they were recording it, and this was on their algorithm, right? But realizing this was not a viral thing on TikTok's um, perspective, this did not go viral for them. It went viral in a lot of towns because if a few people posted it, either people saw it on social or they talked about it so other people knew about it or they showed people with theirs but it wasn't viral on TikTok. So putting things in perspective, if only five people in your community post about it, your community is going to see that pretty quickly, but on bigger scales, it's not viral. So how do you get this to kind of stop knowing that you can get students to be part of the solution by creating the positive change, right? Teaching your kid like, hey, negative people are louder sometimes, but there's way more people who want to be positive. So they started doing a challenge of like the angelic yield where they made the bathrooms better brought supplies in other ones started doing like a devious sip i even saw a devious um dance challenge where they was like a student versus a teacher it was really funny so that like allowing students to be part of the solution another way students are part of the solution is they teach they're actually teaching adults how to respectfully comment here's a junior in high school who actually um uh, there were adults on a facebook page like a town facebook page and uh there was a car accident um, involving a bunch of high school students. And there were 396 adults who made comments like, oh, they were probably on their phones. They probably were being distracted. Where the junior girl actually commented this thing. She's like, oh, I'm the girl from the teen in the car. If you could please stop with the negative comments, it would be really appreciated. The boys are very hurt. As a community, we should be praying that they get better. Because this girl respectfully commented, she didn't make them feel like they had to be defensive, right, and comment back. Most um, adults actually took their comment down or it completely changed the thread from there on out, but nobody was then making rude comments anymore. And I think, well, actually I know, <laughs> uh, people are just tired of how adults are handling things. They're just constantly being defensive and feeling like they need to lash out on people. And it's, it's your tone isn't, it's hard to write your tone of voice in a text. But no matter, even if you use emojis, you can't hear your tone. So I just find it interesting that a junior had to call that out, right? Because you can't be kind online if you're not kind in person and you're not kind in person if you're not kind online. It's all the one person. So how can we make sure people are handling this? And I'm gonna pause for some adult humor for you. Like again, if you know and know who your kid hangs out on, on in person, I'm hoping you know who they hang out with online. Here's some adult humor for you. Hopefully you get it. <laughs> so what is your kids user handles right on gaming devices on instagram on TikTok? what is their user handle if 
it's something like this, I guarantee you some people are not allowing them to hang out with their child, right? Hopefully got that. All right. Here we go. Number eight, um, talk about what a negative or inappropriate comment picture or post is. Uh, like, again, you're sitting down side by side with them, you teach them how to read. You're sitting side with them, teach them how to use this. Is this negative? Is this positive? Right? So here's an example of a negative page. Girl's name, school slut. This is negative. But then after you teach them, okay, this is negative. How could we, what could you say? How could you respectfully comment? So students respectfully commented. They even used hashtag and help because what that is, is kind of like a Batman signal, basically saying like, Hey, my name is, I don't approve of this message. Um, I'm here to remind you, you've crossed that line of being inappropriate, rude, and flat out cruel. So just showing you what they can do on that digital first responder. And I'm here to also tell you parenting is hard, <laughs> right? You think you figured it out and then another kid comes. So parenting is hard. And so here's an example of adults not using social media correct. They went on there as like, I fear the day that technology will take on um, our humanity and the world will be populated by a generation of idiots. Like this is what a parent had to say to this parent. Like they don't know who this person is. In all reality, this parent actually spent more than 20 hours sitting in the airports with their two month old. She actually was on a text message with her mom who was taking care of her other toddler. But this is what we want to do is we want to judge people. We want to judge other parents and we forget how much parenting is hard. Another one did this as a positive one um, that they posted. They posted pic this picture uh, to the woman in Hobby Lobby bathroom. If my hands weren't full of children, I would have applauded you as your son gave you the back talk of a century. You stayed calm and collected while adding 10 more push-ups to use um, to his already growing number. We need more parents like you who aren't afraid to parent their own children because of what somebody else might think. I love that this, you know, that they're showing, you know, positivity, but here's the thing. We also need to share, do we always need to post about things? Like, do we always have our phone out to take capturing things? We can, we just like, remember that moment. Do we always have to engage? Right. So just kind of talking your kid through, Hey, and even saying like, I didn't engage on this post and here's the reason why, Hey, I didn't post this moment because I'm here to be with you. I can also remember it. I don't need to post every single thing. I think these are great conversations we also need to have with our kids and even with ourselves. <laughs> Number nine is communicate openly with your child about social media, right? Like how can you communicate with them? Um, perfect example is just perception versus reality. They look at things like, oh, I wish I had this. Like, oh, she's, you know, they, or they're jealous. They compare themselves to others. Like she's got it so great. Her life is so amazing. When all reality, she's actually in front of a bulletin board at a hospital. She's definitely not living her best life but this is what they think. This is what they compare themselves to. And even adults, like we're really bad at too. Like how many of you guys look at Pinterest and you're like, oh, these things are perfect. And then you look at your Pinterest. Who's had a Pinterest fail? Like I am epically known for them. Like there's mine never looks like the Pinterest picture, right? So we compare ourselves to others, but your perception is only what you see and what you're told. I mean, look, like if you put this close together, your perception of reality depends on what you see, what you're shown and what you're told. This is exactly what the mass media is doing to us is they're purposely posting things to get our attention, to make us react with emotions. So it makes us want to engage. So it is one of those having a conversation with your kids on how they handle situations. There are a lot of them are in group chats for sports and school. So how can they, if a group chat gets out of control, what can they do? These are all student answers and they're all amazing. You can leave the group chat, but the hard part is, is um, you sometimes get sucked back in. Like if you leave the group chat, a person can actually pull you back into that group chat. You can group it. You can mute a group chat. Um, you can mute a group chat, but unfortunately, uh, oh yeah. So that that's great too. Um, you can change the subject, all these different things. This is what they're doing. Um, you could also, Next one, what do you do if they ask for inappropriate photos? And this could even be with memes. This can be, this is, um, this is my name. And, <laughs> um, sorry, uh, in a, asking inappropriate photos. Okay. So they, um, um, yeah, that's what they do is they'll just leave them on red, right? They can even block them. They can do, they, they can say things like, I respect myself too much. My favorite one right there is right. My mom checks my phone. So you need to give your kid examples. Just like if your kid went to a party, 
if they something happens, are you giving them scenarios of what they can do and how they can handle themselves? Okay. Um, so those are the different ways of walking them through some different scenarios on that end. Um, because this is the kind of messages that sometimes they're getting. You can't always control everything. And so how you have that. Okay. Um, the new one that they're being asked is things like, um, um, uh, what was it? Um, what's your body count? Right. And that means how many people have you been with? So these are awkward situations that they don't always want to bring to their parents. You're not the first person they think of when this gets brought to them, but the more less make it awkward for them to come to you about these things, the more comfortable they will to be able to come to you. So when this happens, students come to us because they feel comfortable. We walk them through it. And I love that they then create things like this. Like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to send this photo? Are you sure you can trust the recipient? Right. Are you sure they are who they claim to be? Are you sure they, what they, um, you want to give them something they can hold over your head for more personal and compromising images, right? Are you sure you want to give them this much power? This is not just with nudes. This is also with memes because a lot of students are sending racial memes. They're sending inappropriate memes. And even you yourself, think about it. Like, are you liking things? Are you following certain things? Are you saying my name is, I approve of it. Walking you through some scenarios of how you can have this conversation back home with your kid. In Snap, there's what's called My Eyes Only. It's a feature there. And so basically what happens is they can actually, inside of it, they can actually save photos to what's called My Eyes Only. They can set up a passcode that they would put it in and then this they would go into here. So some of them have that. If there is no passcode set up for My Eyes Only, that means they didn't set it up. So that's kind of a good way. So simply ask them if they have Snapchat, do you have My Eyes Only? And show me, like show me what it is. So that way it's not, and it don't feel like it's an interrogation. It's just more of a natural conversation. Number 10 is knowing the trends, right? Knowing the trends on social media and gaming, especially even gaming, right? I think that's important. So what we do is we actually spotlight 10 students who are doing trend setting work um, to be able to keep making digital for good. So it's really neat. Let's see. Um, um, uh, the first one, um, Sanvi and, uh, and Shreya here. They, a lot of journaling and blogging is really big right now. So these two have actually started that. And so we're actually getting to spotlight them at our digital for good of Brent and celebrating their things. Um, Anna Miller is a vlogger. So she's actually getting paid by um, uh, Airbnb or no. Yeah. Airbnb to go to different cities um, and stay. And then vlog is since she's in a wheelchair is this city will wheelchair accessible for disability able people. So I just think it's neat that we're spotlighting these trends to kind of have that. Uh, what we're also gonna have them send out to you is we have this where it's hyperlinks directly to if you ever need to report anything, cause we need your help. You need to actually help. We need your help to report. Something happens, you say something, you also need to help report. If you don't have to have a discord to go report, you can go right to this link to go report it, makes it easier. And then on this side over on the right side here, those are all hyperlinks for you to go and find the parental controls because we need your help by making sure you set them up, that you actually have them set up. And then the bottom is for uh, law enforcement. Okay. And that's a direct link for them um, on that end. So if anything happens, big thing people always ask me is like, well, we reported something and never got taken down. How can we get help taking things down? So here's three examples of um, some pages to kind of walk you through it. So this one's called a uh, sleeping account where students were making these. It was trending in several schools. They were taking pictures of kids in class sleeping. Um, this one took a while to get taken down, but it does get timely taken down because it is minors. Um, if this was done with adults, it probably wouldn't get taken down because you can't really see people's faces. But because if I went to the school, it'd be easy for me to recognize them. Uh, how you get this taken down is you have to report every single post and the page up at the top with three dots, okay? Um, so that one did come down. This one's called bad parking. This one would not come down. Uh, the reason why is because it is, it's not violating anything. Um, but I love that Jackson, who's one of our interns, he actually uh, was one of the cars featured and uh, cause he was all like respecting and protecting my privacy. He actually had a DM the account saying, hey, can you actually blur out my license plate? And so then from there on out, they actually started blurring out people's license plate because they wanted to respect and protect people's privacy. And the last one, this one got taken down really fast because it does showcase minors images and their entire full name. So that got taken down quickly. Sometimes you do have to report things more than once for it to come down. I think there's been accounts that have had to report six times before it finally came down. So this is kind of a fun test. So just take out your phones and um, 
scan it. If you're on your phone, I'll make sure I send this um, out to the schools if you want to take the test. But it's just a fun way to test yourself on if you know anything. A lot of people are surprised at some of their answers. When you press submit, you'll find out if you got it right or wrong. And then it also has hyperlinks directly to our parental controls or the, the, yeah, the links to the parental controls has hyperlink also to our parental guidelines. Um, so you can see if you get a full, all the answers correct and uh, then get a brag to your friends and your kid <laughs> if you got um, a lot right. Okay, but to end it off, I wanna give you some more answers. And by the way, you might have to, when you get finished, you can take finish taking your test. But just to give you some more ideas of what you can do to go back to you know why we're in such a where we're at is are you making sure yourself and your kids are spending at least one hour a day outside, right? Um, especially when I'm traveling a lot, that's even hard for myself, but uh, that is one thing I try to do. Um, let them be bored. I think that's important because with these devices, like when they're bored, they sometimes want to go directly to that device. Having daily technology free time, family time. Like a lot of times you see these families who are on their couches, um, with their phones and they're doing multiple things. So it's so important that um, you actually say like, this is our time that we're having no devices. And social with peers like this age, it doesn't come naturally for them. So you sometimes might have to help them a little bit, guide them through it. Like um, I've been having to help a lot of college students. I simply just say like, hey, did you, have you had any dinner with people yet? And they're like, oh, well, I asked them, but they haven't got it. You, they have to set it up like, hey, can you have dinner with me on Thursday at 6 p.m.? They have to kind of help them guide them on how to ask, right? Give them responsibilities and chores. I think a lot of parents are saying they're so stressed out they're not giving that. You need to give them responsibilities and chores that they have consistency. And then talk in the car instead of being on their headphones. Talk to them in the car. That's when they're trapped. That's when they're going to have the best conversations um, that you're both on the same page. Let them be part of the solutions. I've had a lot of uh, students who actually create PowerPoint presentations and they, you know, tell them what you're fearful of so they can help you come up with a solution of that you guys can meet in the middle and work together. Set boundaries. Like I gave you some examples. Wi-Fi gets turned off at 10, doesn't come back on until 7 a.m., right? Set boundaries of no phones or at the dinner table, um, no headphones in the car when we're driving to school. Like that's our time to talk, right? Listen and talk and openly. Like there's a lot of things going on and um, it's definitely different. So they want you to listen instead of always wanting to fix things. They just need you to listen sometimes. And then teach by example. Make sure that um, okay, you're telling them when they have their phones out, um, why you have it out, right? And why you're putting it away. Like, hey, I have my phone out because I'm waiting for a call. I'm putting my phone away because I actually want to spend time with you. And then reconnect. I think that's important for parents to kind of see. All right, so there you go. You can um, scan that. Um, that goes right to our socials. And every single week, our students are posting really informative um, stuff to kind of keep having the conversation with your kids and with parents. Um, and you, if you have any questions, you can always go to our website. And uh, in the come things, you can contact us with questions, and we respond back to you. Um, and that's it. Let us know if you have any questions. I'm going to Stop sharing here in a second and see if there was any questions left in the chat for us. But I appreciate you guys coming. Again, I love hearing what you will do from this presentation. What's one thing you're going to take away saying that you will um, what do? So let me show you a couple examples. Here's some. There we go. So some people said, like, I'm going to spend an hour a day. Like, here's some examples of what parents have said they will do. So what is it you're going to do from this presentation and make happen? And there's one more. All right. So Sandy, I'm not sure if there's any questions in the chat. Yeah, looking at the chat, there hasn't been any questions. So if there are any, um, please do post them there. I did share a link to in the chat too as well to the um, social media survey. And I'm going to share the one here to the students part. Um, what was the last link you, or the QR code that you had, Kim? Um, the questions, they want to take the test. OK. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kim. That was incredible. Yay, I'm so glad. Lots, lots of information.
Um, yeah, that way they can go back and do playback if they yeah. or like want to learn something. And then honestly, what I do too, Sandy, is like sometimes I will go right to YouTube. And if you don't want to know more about my eyes only or something like that, um, or you're not sure how to set up the parental controls, like because they constantly change it so much that I just yeah. go right to YouTube and see where the newest um, video is at. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, got a couple of thank yous in there in the chat. So thank you from Sarah. Thank you from Jasper. Thank you for coming, all of you. Thanks, Wayne, for helping me set this up. That was awesome. Well, actually, you did more than I did. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Have everybody. A great night. Thank Thanks, nice everybody. job, Kim. Yep. Thanks, Wayne. Bye, you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.